She was Britain's longest reigning monarch. The one constant in a country that changed so much over so many decades. From the post-war era of food rations to the digital age, the Queen moved with the times and the people moved with her. As popular in the 50s as she was well over 50 years later. Through crises inside and outside her family, public support and affection towards her rarely, if ever, wavered. A monarch admired for her longevity and sense of duty, with her beloved husband by her side and as a widow queen. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born at the home of her mother's parents, 17 Bruton Street, in London's Mayfair. Princess Elizabeth was to them as great At the joy time, her grandfather, King George V, was on the throne. Her father, the Duke of York, was the second son of King George and Queen Mary. When her grandfather died, her uncle Edward became king, but it was a reign that would last just 10 months. He abdicated to marry an American divorcee. His irrevocable determination to renounce the throne. In a year that saw three kings, Elizabeth's father assumed the throne. That she would one day become queen was now not in doubt. She met her future husband two years earlier, in 1934, when they attended the wedding of Prince Philip's cousin, Princess Marina of Greece and the Duke of Kent, who was an uncle of Princess Elizabeth. By the end of the decade, war had broken out and Philip was sent to sea. Elizabeth spent those war years in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. The princess, who was on the eve of her 19th birthday when these pictures were taken, is at the wheel of a 1500-weight truck in convoy. A monarch of the future, but for now a mechanic, and one not afraid to muck in and get her hands dirty. Today is victory in Europe day. When the war ended, she chose to leave the palace and celebrate with the crowds on the streets of London. Two years later, Princess Elizabeth married Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark. A nation still battered and bruised by war, it was a wedding to lift the country's spirits. In 1949, Charles became the first of four children, soon followed by Anne. For a few years at least, they enjoyed relative normality out of the public spotlight. Then came the news that the Queen's father, King George VI, had passed away at the age of just 56. Elizabeth and Philip were in Kenya, only a few days into a five-month tour of the Commonwealth. At 25 years old, a young woman who never imagined in early childhood that she would one day become queen was now head of state. The coronation took place a year later in 1953, an event the Duke of Edinburgh insisted should be televised for the world to see. In the 60s, Andrew and Edward completed the family. The Queen is said to have worried about her children, like any mother. And on her silver wedding anniversary in 1972, she spoke lovingly about what her family meant to her. Now that we have reached this milestone in our lives, we can see how immensely lucky we have been. Or perhaps fortunate might be a better word. We had the good fortune to grow up in happy and united families. Though the Queen and the Duke's marriage was a lasting success, the same could not be said of their children's. In 1992, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson separated. Princess Anne and Mark Phillips divorced. Then Charles and Diana separated. And a major fire engulfed a large part of Windsor Castle. Little wonder then that she didn't consider her 40th year as Queen to be the happiest of her reign. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. But worse was sadly to come in 1997, when Princess Diana was killed in that Paris car crash. The outpouring of emotion from the public was like nothing this country had ever seen before. The lack of any immediate expression of grief from the Queen or other senior royals did not go down well and the Queen was perceived as being out of step with public sentiment. She had assumed her role as grandmother, protecting William and Harry from the public eye at Balmoral. They waited longer than they'd hoped, but eventually the public got the appearance they'd yearned for, 
and the Queen paid this tribute to Diana in a televised statement. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. That dreadful year was to end on a happier note, when the Queen and Prince Philip celebrated their golden wedding anniversary, and the Queen paid her husband this tribute. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. Outside family life, the Queen had many interests, perhaps most famously horses. She loved riding them and watching them too. A regular at the Derby at Epsom and Ascot, where her horses won on several occasions. Such was her love of the outdoors and determination to protect the natural world. She launched the Queen's Commonwealth Canopy, a conservation project with the mission of creating a network of forests in each of the 53 countries of the Commonwealth. Her dedication to the Commonwealth and particularly her beloved home country never wavered, serving more than 600 charities as royal patron or president. Even after the Duke of Edinburgh retired from public life, the Queen continued her busy diary of royal engagements, a life of public service that saw her host well over 100 state visits. In the new millennium, she was also kept busy not just by others, but by her own milestones. A golden jubilee, a diamond one, the moment in 2015 she became the longest reigning monarch, followed a year later by her 90th birthday. And at the age of 96, a weekend of celebrations to mark her platinum jubilee. In between, Good evening, Mr. Bond. there was that appearance in the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics in London. And while she made the headlines, so did the younger generation of the royal family for the right reasons and the wrong ones. Her second son, Andrew, faced allegations of sexual assault by Virginia Dufresne, allegations which he denied. She claimed she was trafficked to have sex with Andrew when she was 17 by convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, who was a friend of the prince. In the end, the Queen stripped Andrew of his honorary military roles and royal patronages, and it was agreed that he would stop using his HRH style. In the Queen's later years, it wasn't just Andrew causing problems for her. Harry and Meghan stunned Buckingham Palace, and indeed the world, in a shock announcement that they wanted out of the royal family. A summit meeting was held at Sandringham, and a deal thrashed out that left Harry with rather less than he might have hoped. Gone was his role as Captain General of the Royal Marines. Gone too his position as Commonwealth Youth Ambassador, to which the Queen appointed him. Harry and Meghan began a new life in California. It was there that they gave Oprah Winfrey a bombshell interview about their old life in the UK and how it left Meghan feeling suicidal. I just didn't want to be alive anymore. And that was a very clear and real and frightening constant thought. It was one of many shocking revelations. Others included allegations of racism within the royal family. A new crisis for the Queen to deal with, just as the country, and indeed the whole world, was beginning to emerge from its biggest health crisis for a century. The coronavirus pandemic was a heartbreaking, stressful and anxious time, and the Queen found the words to comfort her people in only her fifth special television address of her reign. I hope in the years to come, everyone will be able to take pride in how they responded to this challenge. And those who come after us will say the Britons of this generation were as strong as any. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. One year and four days after that television address, the Queen was grieving her own personal loss, as so many had done that year. After 73 years of marriage, her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, passed away at the age of 99. Restrictions on numbers allowed at funerals were still in place, rules that applied to the royal family just as much as everyone else who'd lost loved ones during the pandemic. The widow queen continued her busy diary of engagements 
just as she had with Prince Philip by her side. There were times when, on doctor's orders, those engagements became virtual instead. That commitment to serving her country and the Commonwealth is a legacy she passes on to the new king and those who will follow. With such a loyal sense of duty despite her personal grief, old age and family drama in the background, it isn't hard to see why public affection for the Queen remained as high as ever. This was a duty she did not choose, a destiny which befell her at the age of just 10, a monarch through times of so much change and one whose reign is unlikely to be surpassed any time soon.